So what a joy to have you, Nitin. And even a greater joy to have, of course, the person that we love more than anyone else in the world around us, which is Mr. Keval Noria. What a delightful occasion to have Keval Noria ji with us, along with his son. As Mr. Keval Noria said to us a few years back, that an occasion occurred in his life and somebody said, there goes the father of Nitin Noria. And he said, you know, from that day, his whole status changed, you know. So what a delightful gift to receive to have a son like that. And I want to welcome all of you wonderful people who have chosen to be part of this conversation today. And uh, I would like to request the person whom I love amongst, um, amongst a few people in my life whom I, I have a bias to say the person amongst a few people I love the most is Mr. Keval Noria. And so he's been chairman of the Grow Talent Company, chairman of Soil, continues to inspire us every day by his presence. So I would request Mr. Keval Noria to give his opening comments as the father of Dr. Nathan Noria, and then we will turn to the conversation between us. Well, Anil, thank you for inviting me to say a few words. First of all, Nitin has heard so much about soil and so much about you that this interaction must be very special for him. As far as I am concerned, I think I have been blessed, as, I, as you know, at every stage of my life. And therefore, I was lucky to have a wonderful spouse who brought up two good children. I used to tell my children, okay, look, all professions are good. Follow your passion so that you can do well in life. Because my theory was that the air is fresh only at the top of the hill. So therefore, if you follow your passion, you are likely to be something. But it was their mother who really pushed them to excellence. So it doesn't matter what performance they did. She always said, you can do better. I think she was always perpetually dissatisfied, you can say. And I think that is what probably made them achieve excellence. So if they have done well, I think the major credit would lie to their mother. That's the first thing I want to say. Second, I want to say is that I'm happy that both of them chose noble professions. My daughter became a doctor to look after the health of the people. And my son became a teacher to give education to the people. So nobody can be happier than that. And of course, Nitin gave me the ultimate pleasure and pride of being known as father. So I would say, God bless them. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so Nitin, now turning to you. You know, we have heard so many things about your illustrious career, about uh, the research you have done, about how you have transformed institutions, including as illustrious as Harvard. And you've done your bit to take it to the next level. So amongst all the things that you have done, Nathan, in your life, when you recall, what have been some of those moments that stand out for you when you and your colleague were at your happiest best? So the first, I must um, thank you for inviting me. I've, I've been an admirer of everything you've done for a long time, as my father has been. And if you think about happy moments, in some ways, there are a few days that could be happier than this moment, right? So if you just think about what it means, this is the, actually, I think it's the first time that my father has had the opportunity to introduce me uh, <laughs> in a forum like this. And that's a very special occasion, right? It's a very special occasion to feel that um, as blessed as I felt to be his son, he feels equally blessed now to be my father. And, you know, we both remember my mother right now. And she was a remarkable influence in both our lives. So we're very grateful for that. And of course, someday you should interview my sister, who's the best of us all. So you should get a chance to meet her because I've always said that my uh, sister is the real engine uh, of goodness 
in our family. There's uh, nobody who's a more good person than she is. But if I think about occasions in my life when I've been happy, I think that they have been, uh, I'll give you three examples. And these are three examples that are just different illustrations of what are the kinds of things that give me joy. Uh, I remember when I was applying to uh, IIT Bombay uh, and wrote the exam, I was absolutely convinced that I was not gonna get in. Uh, it was like, I wrote the exam and I said, in fact, it was my father who even, you know, after the first uh, exam, I came to lunch and I said, there's no point in going to the rest of the exam. He says, you know, I hope to challenge you know, why don't you at least finish the rest of the exam? So I finished the rest of the exam. And then if I had gone at that, and those days, the only way you found out about where you were in IIT was um, you had to read the notice board, right? I mean, you actually didn't get the, uh, you didn't get an admissions letter. You didn't know any other way. So you had to go and read a notice board. So a friend of mine said that, you know, oh, your name is on the notice board. And I said, you know, you know, like there's no chance. I mean, you know, you're just like, he says, no, 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 go look. It's somewhere around 600. I saw your name somewhere around 600. So I know that my mother used to always be angry when I didn't stand first in class, but this was the happiest I ever was when I stood 600th and something, right? So it was one of the happiest days in my life was to, and, in some, and you know, that was a moment that reminded me about how much single moments can change the arc of your life. I, I have often wondered what would my life have looked like had I not been 600 on that list and not gone to IIT. Probably I would have done well too, but I do know that in some very deep sense, that moment changed quite profoundly the set of possibilities that I had uh, in my life. So I, I use that as an illustration that you have to have the humility to know that your own success is often shaped by these knife edge moments and these knife edge moments can go either way. And so, you know, you, you never know. So it's the grace of something that allows the fork, the fork in the road that you meet to turn in the right direction. And I've been very blessed in life to have at many stages in life, such forks appear that have turned in the right direction in that way. And, you know, coming to, so I've often said that my life is a series of happy accidents. Uh, so, you know, the, you can have sad accidents too, but I've been very blessed to have had happy accidents. A second moment like this is that, uh, you know, you, when you put a lot of time into something and you hope that what you get at the end is something that you feel good about and not just you feel good about, but others feel good about. That's a second source of happiness. When you have poured a lot of time, energy and attention into something you've tried to translate your vision into action and then the action is produced. And then at the end of that, you have to see how it goes, right? Like there's, there's no escaping the reality of what you do when that moment comes. And so whether it was producing my first book or when we launched Field at Harvard Business School, you know, we sent all 900 students to international destinations. I remember my board of deans advisors saying, that's a crazy idea. You're never gonna be able to execute that. And uh, I, when everybody had gone to all these different locations, every day I would ask the faculty and staff team that had traveled with them to send me a text message that everybody's accounted for at the end of the day, because the board of deans advisors, I said, you might be able to send them all, but will you be able to get them all back, right? Like who knows what happens to people when they travel to all parts of the world. So when everybody was accounted for back on the Harvard Business School campus and everybody said that this was one of the best learning experiences that they'd had, then all the planning, all the work, all the thinking that had gone into that event felt, and there was happiness that others had. So you can share that happiness with them, even though you know this was something in which your own anxiety was quite wrapped up as well. But so I found that to be a second kind of moment when you plan for something for many years, you then execute it and it works the way you would hope, not just for you, but for others that you had done it for. And the third thing is that, and probably this has always been my greatest satisfaction, is that I remember when uh, Rakesh Khurana became Dean of Harvard College. Now your participants may not know this, but Rakesh was a student of mine. He wandered into my office looking to be a PhD student. I encouraged him to become a PhD student. He then became a, I was his doctoral student advisor. But you know, when he became 
college, I, I can genuinely say I felt happier than I felt when even I became Dean of our business school. And that has always been true. I have found great happiness in seeing people whom I've had some privilege of being involved in. I mean, I don't ever wanna claim that Rakesh's success is in any way due to me. Rakesh's success is all due to him. And similarly, all the other people in life who I've had been privileged to teach, to, to work with, who have been successful. But the fact that you can be around people and enable them to in, realize their full potential and celebrate that moment when it happens, probably that has given me more happiness in life than anything else. What a nice discovery, Nathan. What a nice discovery. And talk a little bit more about how do you see this potential in others? Like in Rakesh's case, what encouraged you to, to spot that? What is it that you observed about Rakesh and what is it that you were then part of co-creating with him? So I, I think that my experience is that if people have curiosity, it's the, it's the part that I first am most drawn to. So I'm most drawn to people who seem to have a infinite amount of curiosity. They'll ask questions. They have a curiosity to learn more. If you give them advice, they'll at least take it seriously. That doesn't mean all your advice is good, but they're, they're people who you feel like if you're giving them advice or if you're investing in them, you can see the evidence that they're taking that investment seriously because that motivates you to then do more. Right? Like if, if you say something to someone and you have no obvious sense that they were doing anything with it, then you know at some point you say, what's the point of my investing in them too? So that innate curiosity combined with an openness to input, I think can create a fabulous relationship with people and then they grow and oftentimes you form a relationship with them with, where you grow too, because you're learning things from them. You're learning things uh, that you would never have thought about, but you're also learning how to become a better teacher because you learn from a person what influences them and what doesn't influence them, which you can use with other people. But I think that the, for me, the single most important thing is curiosity and openness in the other person. What a nice gift. And they are saying that that is the heart of learning agility. All the research on learning agility says it all begins with that childlike curiosity to say, is that so? Yeah. <laughs> so, so that and, whole... you can see, and I'm sure that as a teacher, you've seen that too, right? Like you meet the people and you can instantaneously, yes. it doesn't take long yes. to tell who has genuine curiosity versus, uh, I also like people who are not thinking too far ahead. Like I, I believe that good things happen to people who are focused on the now. So if you end up being too obsessed with, will I be successful? I think you stumble. Whereas if you're focused on the ground in front of you and to take the best next first step, I think you'll go a very long way. So I, I like people who, who don't, it's not like they're not ambitious, but they're not already thinking about what they're gonna do seven steps ahead. They're focused on the moment to learn the most that they can today to make the best of the opportunity that has been given. And so I, I, I find myself investing more in people like that. Oh, nice. Nitin, when you were graduating from IIT, you may have had many choices to make. What made you go on this journey of uh, education and then becoming a teacher? Because that's very unconventional. That's not the path most IIT graduates take. So even here, you know, as I said to you at the beginning, I'm actually a very accidental academic. I, I'd be lying if I said to you that my dream after IIT Bombay was to become an academic. I, I really wanted to be an entrepreneur. So my dream was that uh, my father had uh, spent his entire life in some ways working for large corporations, but somewhere in this back of his mind had harbored the interest in being an entrepreneur. Uh, that interest was one that even in IIT, I tried various things. I ran mostly failed small businesses at IIT Bombay, but nevertheless, it was my dream one day to become an entrepreneur. So I wanted to apply to MBA programs. And then I had a cousin who visited me, who at that time was studying uh, in engineering at MIT, who said, you know, you're applying to MBA programs, but how do you imagine that you're going to pay to go? Because in 1988 in, in India, there were currency controls. It was very hard to go. Uh, 
people might find it hard to believe because they think of my father as a successful CEO, but at that time, actually, he didn't have the money to pay for the tuition that, uh, you know, would have been required at that time to go and study at a, at a business school. So he says, you know, if you want a scholarship, you'll have to apply to a PhD program because in PhD programs in business, they'll give you a scholarship, but in MBA programs, they don't give you a scholarship. So frankly, I just cut my list of applications in half and I ended up applying to schools, half of them PhD programs, half of them MBA programs. And at that time, I was naive enough to think that a PhD was nothing but an advanced MBA, that, you know, I was young, I was 22. So, okay, what's the difference? If someone's paying for it four years, I'll get an, an advanced MBA as opposed to a, a you know, regular MBA. It's only when I arrived at MIT that I realized that there was actually no connection between an MBA program and the PhD program. And it took me almost two years. And a wonderful advisor of mine actually helped me see. So again, I've been the beneficiary of great advice and, and great mentors as well, who made me realize that being an entrepreneur, being an academic is the same as being an entrepreneur. He says an academic is an intellectual entrepreneur. Because if you think about, at least in the US, what you have to do to be a successful academic, we live in the marketplace of ideas. And unless you produce ideas that have currency, we live in the marketplace of students. And unless you teach students who think that you can really be a special teacher to them, you don't progress. So he says, you know, this is the same as what you would do if you're an entrepreneur. You'd have to produce a product that you'd have to sell to the world. You'd have to find customers who'd be interested in your stuff. So don't think that this is not entrepreneurship. It's in fact a very, <laughs> pure form of entrepreneurship. And once I got connected to that idea, it was like, uh, again, if a fork in the road that I would have never imagined taken, but what a wonderful fork to have taken, right? I, I, I ended up choosing by accident something that has become the greatest joy of my life is to be a, a professor and a teacher and, and an academic. And it's a path that led to many wonderful things. You know, I want to turn my attention now to the time when you were chosen as the Dean of Harvard. And that was also around the time that we had this, the greatest uh, financial crisis for a long time. Yeah. And soon after that, and then you were got into this role and you know, and I'm told that you actually called a meeting of all the faculty to ask, how could you take responsibility for what had occurred? Can you talk a little bit more about that? See, I think that you know our uh, our mission of her at Harvard Business School has been to educate leaders who make a difference in the world. And it was a moment in which people were asking the question whether we'd made a negative difference in the world, right? Uh, and I don't think we were doing that deliberately. So it's not like we wake up in the morning and we say, "Hey, guess what? We're going to educate students who are going to go out and do terrible things in the world." We have always, from the very start of the school, been inspired to produce leaders. You know, the original mission statement of our business school was to educate leaders who could make a decent profit decently. Right. And uh, actually, our founding was after a financial crash, crash of 1907. So here we were, we were just about reaching our 100 years when I became dean, and our 100th year coincided with the second financial crash. And so it made us at least ask serious questions whether we had, whether we needed to rethink what we were doing in terms of are we educating leaders who are not as sensitive to risk? Are we educating leaders who are, who have become somehow more attached to short term profit making without understanding what the long term consequences might be? Are we educating leaders who don't understand that? the idea that customer beware, because there's many people after the financial crisis who said, you know, we didn't force anybody to buy a mortgage that they couldn't afford. It was their choice to buy the mortgage that we couldn't afford. That this idea that buyer beware is not a good ethical stance to take, that in fact, you need to be more sensitive about what would be a good product or a bad product for your customers. So this notion that to reaffirm and remind ourselves that our education should be not just about competence, but about character, it was an important moment, I think, for us to take stock of that, to ask ourselves, how could we recommit ourselves to our founding intention and to have our second decade be one in which there may well still be times in which our leaders make mistakes, but at least we will use those moments to re-examine where we may have made missteps and how we can improve going forward. 
So from that moment onwards, Nitin, you stepped into a role of an institution with very rich history and legacy. And now it was your opportunity to take the school to the next level. So what were some of the things that you consciously started learning and considering on how to pivot HBS itself into new directions? Could you talk to us a little bit about that? So, you know, when I first uh, became Dean, I, I, I did what I used to, you know, I was a student of leadership and I used to teach people about leadership. So I said, it's a good moment now. In fact, someone, some people used to joke at that time, okay, you've been teaching leadership for 22 years now. Now let's see if you can actually practice it, right? So, and I've learned that the practice of leadership is a little bit harder than, than the teaching of leadership. But nevertheless, I tried to at least practice some of the things that I used to teach. So the first thing that I did was I went and had one-on-one -on -one conversations with every member of my faculty. So in about three months, I had 500 one-on-one -on -one conversations because I wanted to understand from people what they felt the institution needed to do as it was beginning its second 100 years. So right, I, was, I became Dean in the 102nd year of the institution. We were founded in 1908. I became Dean in 2010. So this was really the beginning of our second century. And I wanted to make sure so a, a dear colleague of mine had shared with me this research that uh, if you ask yourself the question, how many of the world's top 50 universities were German universities in 1900, what would be your guess? Very few. So 32 to 38 of the world's top universities in 1900 were German universities. Really? Yeah. This is a. I didn't know that. Yeah. This is a historian and his account. Yes. And he says, you know, how many by the end of, by 2000, which is about the top, you know, like he said, by 2010, when I became Dean, he says, you know, how many German universities Nathan, now are in the top 50? And the answer is one, right? So he said, what happened to all these great German universities? They didn't die. They just became less relevant. So he shared this lesson with me saying that as great as Harvard Business School is, it has no birthright to stay great for the rest of its time. So don't be seduced into having comfort with the greatness of our business school. And your job is to be the person who challenges that comfort, that there will be a lot of people who are just comfortable with the institution being where it is. And so through this listening tour, I tried to come up with a set of things that I thought were, you know, the question I would ask anybody, if there was one thing that would make you excited about the next 100 years of our business school that we could do today, what would that be? Right. So that's the way that, that was the question that I would ask. And out of these 500 things, there were four or five major areas in which these, I, I, you know, I then articulated these five I priorities, innovation in our MBA programs, where we tried to launch field, where we tried to launch our business school online, uh, intellectual ambition, where we said, rather than just do individual faculty research, we should now do research that speaks to the important problems in business and society. So we did the US competitiveness project. We did much more work in healthcare uh, to continue to make sure that the school was international. So we added our research centers around the world. We write about 250 cases a year. Over time, by last year, 60% of our cases are now international cases. So you know we've really increased the international footprint of the school. We wanted to make the school more inclusive that while the number of women at Harvard Business School had been increasing steadily, their satisfaction with their experience, their performance at Harvard Business School lagged the experience of men. And we said, you know, why should that be? So we worked very hard to try and make the school more inclusive. And then for many, many years, we had been quite, uh, even though we were a part of Harvard, we acted as if we were, we were quite isolated from Harvard. And I felt that this is a great university. And if we could find a way to work with other parts of the university, we would do better things yet. So we created something, you know, so an example of that, we created the iLab, which was an opportunity to spark entrepreneurship. You'll see this entrepreneurship theme come up again and again in, 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 in my life. And so I was very excited to create this iLab, which has now become a hub of entrepreneurship all across the university. But in each case, my instinct was that my job was to drive innovation at the start of this second century. And even if things failed and some things did fail, you couldn't be afraid of failure, that this was a moment in the school's history where 
it just needed to allow itself to think uh, differently about its future while still staying true to the things, you know, case method is still in our soul and uh, research that is has power and practice is still in our soul. So you have to protect the things that are a part of your soul, but you can't be afraid to try new things as well. So Nitin, how are you reading this current crisis, which is absolutely unprecedented? You know, and we are right in the midst of it as we are dealing with it, especially a country like India is going through a lot of pain in trying to learn how to take on this challenge. So how are you reading this pandemic? And what is emerging to you from inside on how we may want to respond to this? So I think it, at, at one level, my view of this pandemic is that uh, even though it has caused many of us to retreat into our own homes and in some ways become hyper-local, right? Like we've all become hyper-local. Our, our, the places where we move and the places where we travel have become even confined to our home, let alone traveling the world. The pandemic reminds us that the challenges that the world face are actually ones that now unite all of humanity. So whether it's our health, which can be affected by something that happens everywhere, climate change, which is another thing that, so I hope that in fact, on the other side of this, we will recognize that while the pandemic is an example of an acute crisis that has affected us now, there are chronic crises that are out in the world that we should be paying attention to. It has brought into sharp focus inequality because we've all seen in every part of the world that the people who have been most affected by the pandemic in terms of those who've gotten ill are the ones who actually have, who we've now des described as essential workers. They are the ones who need to still keep working while the rest of us can operate from the comfort and safety of our homes. And so they get sicker and this has been true. So if you look at everywhere in the world and you look at the composition of who gets the virus, poor people who have no choice but to live in close quarters or to take public transportation or to do the things that can't isolate them are the ones who've been affected the most. So to me, the pandemic has been first and foremost a wake up call to some of these deeper chronic issues that have been going on in society, which the pandemic as an acute moment has brought to our consciousness. How well people have managed the pandemic is a thing that I think historians will have to judge because it's this very complicated trade-off between human lives and the other part, which also starts with lives, which is human livelihood, because it's very hard to have human life without livelihood. On the other hand, if you pay too much attention to livelihood, you might compromise human lives. So I think that there's been a delicate balancing act and some countries seem to have done it well, some countries seem to have done it less well. But I do think that it's still too early to tell. I, 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 don't, I, I believe that the assessment of what's happening in the pandemic, we should be, it's still not over. So you know, time will tell how, how all of this unfolds. And then I think on the other side of the pandemic, there will be some clear changes that are likely to occur. Uh, the boundaries between work and home and what we think of as where work gets done will be re-examined. I think supply chains and the shape of supply chains will get reconfigured uh, in, in a profound way. Uh, I think the tension between China and America, which was growing, the pandemic has only made more severe. So it's gonna have very broad geopolitical consequences as well, because this moment has sharpened that geopolitical conflict. And I don't think it's gonna easily subside or recede. So we're gonna see some pretty profound changes once this acute moment is over as well. So I don't think we should underestimate the pandemic's longer term consequences beyond the near term challenges that we all see of deaths, declining economies, struggling people, joblessness. So these are all absolutely terrifying near term possibilities mental health issues as people are staying at home. I and mean, there's so much that this pandemic has produced in the short run uh, and we should manage that well. But I do think that there'll be longer term consequences that will be no less salient. 
Before I open the conversation to questions from the audience, I have a question on behalf of all the young people who are in this forum today. What is your message for the young people who are in the beginning of their own life's journey? Don't get too attached to any vision of the world that you have today. R remain curious. Uh, have the openness to know that sometimes life will deal surprises that may end up being the happiest surprises that you have. So the very thing that I said to you about what attracts me to students, curiosity and openness, uh, I think I will just play that back to people and say, if you have curiosity, if you have openness, if you focus on doing the best you can today, I think the likelihood that you'll have a great tomorrow is better than if you're constantly worried about what will be a great tomorrow. So just focus on doing the best you can today and you'll be blown away. I mean, people are always looking for people who do great things and, and they need to invest in young people too. So if you're someone who someone experiences a special, the opportunities that will come to you uh, are quite extraordinary and allow yourself to be surprised a little bit by the world. One of our teachers from the Chinmaya Vidyalaya that I happen to serve uh, part of Chinmay Mission, Alka, she wants to know as per the recently announced national education policy, the first five years of education in India would now be in the mother tongue. It, what is your own response to this idea as an academic? Look, all of the research in the world seems to suggest that cognitively being bilingual is a good thing. Uh, it creates cognitive flexibility. In fact, there's a fair amount of uh, good research that's been done on this, uh, that people who end up being bilingual, who can travel, who can, whose mind can move quickly between multiple languages, uh, there's a certain type of cognitive flexibility that that creates that can be quite helpful. Great. So to the extent that this policy does not end up discouraging people from being truly bilingual, and actually encourages people to be bilingual, then it may be a fine thing. But I worry that so many of these things are now motivated by a world in which things are getting politicized. And it's hard to unpack whether the motive that is behind this is something that is what I said, or is the motive behind this something that is meant to say, you know, well, I need to pay attention to my local language or my local state, and this is a way of privileging that. I, I don't think that the world can easily retreat into being local. I mean, we're living in a world in which you have to be local and global simultaneously. And as the colonial yoke, where English appears to be a colonial yoke, you know, we can carry that weight because of course we, we should in some ways think hard about what kinds of colonial weight we carry. But I do think that English is lingua franca of the world and we, we better get, if we wanna be global, we better get on with that too. Wonderful. Nitin, our Dean of Soil, Dr. Neetika Batra, who was a, is a former investment banker and could have been, you know, she was in the US as well, but she's chosen to be in, into this field of academics. She's saying, how are you reading the future of business school education and what should the people running business schools pay greater attention to right now? So I think that, you know, for one way of thinking about business education is that for the first 100 years, we were like the Ford Model T, right? There was one way of delivering business education and that was two-year MBA programs, which Howard Business School and Tuck pioneered at the start of the 20th century. And in the 21st century, we can already see that the same kind of, you know, like the general motorization of business education has occurred, right? There's been segmentation, differentiation, there's lots and lots of variety now. So MBA education can be consumed in a wide variety of ways. So that's the first thing to note that we moved from a world in which there was a homogeneous way to consume management education to a much more heterogeneous way of consuming management education. Some of that is good, some of that is not good. Because if anything allows you to say that I have management education, I wonder whether then people believe, is this a real education? So for something to be experienced by society as a real education, 
there must actually be a core body of knowledge that you have mastered. So imagine a world in which we thought that doctors could become doctors without studying anatomy or without studying physiology or without studying anything. So there's no sense of a core curriculum or a core body of knowledge that people have to master. I wonder over time whether we will simply cheapen management education as an idea. So I, I, while I embrace the idea that management education can and should be delivered in multiple forms that suit students in different ways, I worry that if we are not careful, if it looks like anything qualifies as management education, that's not going to be a good thing. And the second part that I said is that we came up, uh, two colleagues of mine, Srikant Dathar and David Garvin did a very big study, and I'm sure that you must be aware of it, on the future of management education, in which they made these distinctions that leadership is about knowing, doing, and being. Knowing is the mastery of a body of knowledge. Doing is translating that body of knowledge into action. And being is being experienced by yourself and others as having the character to lead. So not just knowing what to do, but knowing what the right thing to do is so that you can then be trusted by others. I think that management education still has a long way to go from knowing to doing to being. And we need to be investing more in the doing and being of leadership. That's something that we have tried to do at Harvard Business School in the last decade, but I still think we're in the early phases of moving management education in that, direc that direction. And I know that you at Soil are very much focused on that doing and being part of, of management education as well. So I applaud you for trying to move management education in that direction. Thank you, Nathan. Karthik Malhotra, one of our new students, he's asking a question that uh, I was reading online that HPS has decided to bring the MBA students back to campus with hybrid learning. If this is true, how did this idea strike your mind? And do you think this could be a starting of a new way of learning and teaching in colleges around the globe, this hybrid model? So look, uh, the genesis of the idea of hybrid teaching for us was that we have now learned that the technical aspects of what we can teach can easily be taught online, right? So it was a forced recognition. None of us thought that, that on March 11th of this year, we made the decision that we were going to move our business school to a fully online education when students return from spring break. If someone had said to me that that would happen in my lifetime, I would have said, you got to be kidding me. There's no way that that can happen. But we proved that we can, and when students learned their courses for that remainder of the period, they didn't complain about not being able to learn technology and operations management or finance or anyone. So the technical knowledge could be conveyed. But in education, the knowledge production is embedded in a social context because there's a lot to learn from the social context as well. So I've often said that there are meta skills that you learn from learning with each other that are different from what you learn personally. Like in a case classroom, you gain a sense over time about what makes you influential in terms of how you influence others in a classroom. It makes you more aware that why did I not see this part of the case that this other student saw? It makes you recognize who it is that is able to influence people differently than you and what does that mean about. So there's a lot of ways in which you learn socially that are very hard to replicate in the online environment. So our view was of hybrid was that, look, we know that it's unlikely that we can return all our students into our classrooms. So if we create a hybrid classroom, at least we continue to give students the opportunity to have it in some small dose, those opportunities to develop those meta capabilities, even as we teach them the technical things in some of our online classes. We are clearly learning that the future of the world will be a mix of these different ways of teaching. I still think that there are probably some things that are best done in person where everybody's together. I think that there'll be other things that are best done online and then there may be some things that are done in a hybrid world. So this moment I think will drive innovation quite significantly in terms of how we teach going forward. Narendra who works with the Chinmaya Organization of Rural Development who are doing some amazing work on rural development. And uh, your mother incidentally when she visited their site was so moved that she spontaneously went and 
offered a significant sort of area of support to those uh, to the women in Kangla. And so this is a person from the same organization. He's read your article about rethinking MBA program. And he wants to know this whole aspect of character building and not merely competence. These things have inspired them a lot in their context. So how do you change the focus from people who are merely job seekers to say, give me the skills, make me marketable so that I can sort of have an economic living out of my MBA. How do you bring about uh, this inner conversation on the inner journey amongst them? Because a lot of people are much more materialistic and this is more uh, of a conversation around the intangibles and some people don't quite value the intangible that much, even though they pay lip service to it. So how do you sort of do that? So I, I, I would actually challenge that premise to begin with, right? So I, I, with great humility, I think that we, we tend to too easily characterize people as being of types. So-and-so is materialistic, so-and-so is spiritualistic, so-and-so is this, so-and-so is that. My experience is that all of us have in us the capacity to be all of these things. I have seen spiritualistic people who claim to be spiritualistic to be more materialistic than, than most people might imagine. And I have found people who are sometimes described as materialistic, quite capable of self-reflection, and while they may not go every day to the temple, they're quite capable of, of being people of character. So I, I, A, I would just say that we should be a little cautious of typecasting people too quickly into one type or another. So I used to teach a course at Harvard Business School. I was very privileged to teach it. Uh, Bill George, one of my colleagues who wrote a book that you might know is a very, very good book on, on purpose and true north, developed this course. So all credit to him for having brought us into this journey. It was a course called authentic leadership development. And the course had a completely different way of teaching than anything that we done at Harvard Business School. Students would form small six person leadership discussion groups. They would write a contract with each other that all of those discussions needed to be confidential. And the purpose of those conversations, so we had a case and then it would be followed by a leadership discussion group and then a debrief. And they had the most profound discussions in which they were encouraged to take a inward journey as opposed to an outward journey. From your life story, tell your life story to each other and that will help you discover where your values come from. When have you been, as you asked me the question, your happiest and what do you learn from that moment and how can you make sure therefore you put yourself in situations that are like that? What is your purpose? Even if your purpose is to make money, how do you hope to make money? Uh, so I, I actually think that people want to live in the end successful lives, but a successful life is also one in which you gain the respect of people, not just for your money, but for the ways in which you live, live your lives. I, I still remember one of the most profound moments in my life was the passing away of my maternal grandfather, who was not a very successful person in a professional sense, but more people came spontaneously to his funeral than to any of the successful people's funerals that I know. And that was because he was a generous person and he was more generous than anybody. I, he constantly would bring people home to eat dinner. And my Naniji would always say like, Aaj kis ko le but he would say, you know, there's plenty of food in this house. Aapko khana kam hai kya? To kya farak padta hai? Isko bhi hai to koi badi baat hai. So that reminded me that in the end, we all are judged by both our competence and our character. And I think everybody knows that intuitively. So if you give students the opportunity to think harder about their character, I think they are very willing to go in that direction. And we just had to create that pathway at Harvard Business School as opposed to somehow being stuck in this view that our students were materialistic or this, that or the other. In fact, Nathan, when we were thinking about the soil and I, it's quite remarkable that we went to the ashram at Siddhbadi and we spent three days in reflecting about why we are creating the school. And the vision statement came out, uh, building leaders with character, competence, and enthusiasm. And at that time, we had no idea that, uh, you know, Shrikant Datar and his team are doing this research. And a few years later, we, were, we discovered that book and we 
came to know that that was happened. So it's quite remarkable as to how, you know. I like happened. your enthusiasm phrase as well. I will borrow that. <laughs> yes, and to us and to the other world that if you define what your purpose in life is and you discover your gifts and learn to leverage your gifts towards purpose, then that produces that enthusiasm. Yeah. I also think that, again, I find sometimes putting these things as too sharply in contrast is disinvites people from a journey of character. So if you say to a person that if you're pursuing money, then somehow or the other, I will decide that you're not a person of character. Why is that wrong? I mean, why is the pursuit of money done well, incompatible with having good character? I mean, I, or, or saying that I wish to have a successful career. So ambition doesn't have to necessarily be at odds with being a good person. So I think that we should be willing to both embrace ambition, embrace people's desire to do better for themselves, but to say that being self-interested is not a bad thing. Being self-centered is what you need to avoid, right? Like I've always told my students that there's a real, dis there's a real distinction between self-interest and being self-centered. Nobody in the world denies self-interest, right? Yeah. Everybody has to have some self-interest. So having some self-interest is not a bad thing. Just don't become self-centered. Find ways in which the pursuit of your own interest creates value for others too. So I always say to people that if you live your life in an equation in which you create more value for others than you claim for yourself, you will be the richest person in the world. What a wonderful statement. Yes, thank you. What a wonderful statement. Nitin, Rahul Jham, who heads one of the businesses of Aditya Birla Group, he's asking a question that he said, how do you inculcate students of this kind who celebrate the now that you talked about and how do you change the admission process for business schools to make that happen and along with that is this question that people who are teaching good business so there is a statement that teachers always teach who they are rather than no matter what they teach so how do you then create kind of role model teachers who are not just merely facilitators of great knowledge, but who themselves are living the values that the school is trying to build. I mean, I, I think that, look, um, we have tried very, so we, 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 about 15 years ago, and I've kind of doubled down on this, we, we started to insist that every student that we would admit at Harvard Business School we would interview as opposed to just looking for the resumes. We got rid of people writing multiple essays because we thought that those essays were being written by consultants and were just manufactured presentations of self rather than authentic presentations of self. We added things where we asked people to write something right after the interview so that if we didn't learn something about them that they felt that the interview was left out then they had a further opportunity to express that self. We've you can fail an interview at Harvard Business School in one of two ways, by being shallow or by, by appearing to be someone who is self-centered and has no interest in contributing to others. So we've tried to do what we can to get some, the best glimpse we can, whether you're a person who is, uh, has the character to want to contribute to others in addition to doing well for yourself. So we have no anxiety about people saying, I want to do well for myself. As I said, I, I don't have any, any issue with that. But we want to make sure that in the process, they don't think that the only way to do well for myself is by crushing others, right? Like I can actually build others up too, and that will allow me to do even better uh, for myself. Are we reliably good at this? I'm not sure we're reliably good at this. I don't think anybody is reliably good at this. So we all in our admissions processes could start to look for other ways in which we might get a better sense of character. But I don't want to be confused. On the other hand, it's not like competence is unimportant, right? Like we, we do need to admit super smart students. We do need to admit students who are sharp, who have shown through their intellectual curiosity in life that they can learn things rapidly and master them and put them to good use. So uh, while our assessment of character lags our assessment of competence, because we have, I think, better ways of assessing competence. I just want to make sure that if we ended up in a school in which all we had was character and no competence, I'd be as disappointed as I would if the other way around. Yes, and in one of the interviews, you mentioned that uh, organizations which are 
undermanaged and overled can have the same kind of problems as well. Yeah, and so I, I think, and I think that you know, um, I'm not trying to create a religious sect here, right? Yeah. We're trying to create business leaders who are going to go out and do important things in the world. We want them to have character, but we also want to have them have the competence that people can entrust them with large sums of money, with running big organizations. And that's a huge responsibility, just like you wouldn't want an incompetent doctor to be operating on you. You wouldn't want an incompetent manager leading an organization in which society has entrusted so many of its resources, whether it's the ambitions of people, the talent of young folks, the wishes of customers, the money of investors. I mean, a, a business organization is a holder of an enormous amount of trust that society places in it. You don't want the people who run these things to have either lack the competence or the character to be good custodians of this trust. So Nathan, since you use the word customer, there's a question that has come from the education here. Is the customer the student or is the customer the industry which the student has to be employed by? Or are they both customers? So I, for sure, students are not customers. I, 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 I have a very strong personal philosophy about this, which is, and maybe this is where being bilingual philosophically as much as by language has been helpful, right? The idea of a guru shishya or the idea of what a student is is a profoundly moral relationship. Whereas I think with a customer, yes, you have a commitment to the customer, but I believe you have such a greater commitment to your students than you have to a customer that I don't want to ever cheapen our relationship I have with a student by thinking of them as a customer. To be honest, I try to avoid the customer language in everything that we do at the school. So even though I know that the customer language in business is very important and we're a business school, I have always felt that even the employers are not our customers. We have students who get employed. We want to make sure that they get employed well. We want to train them in ways in which they'll be attractive to the customers. But if we just thought about it that way, then all we would care about is what is the customer want that we should train in our students. And so it's almost as if our student is a product for a customer, which it isn't because our student is important unto themselves. I don't care about just one employer that they have. I, don't, I wanna make sure that my students leave Harvard Business School, both feeling capable of getting great jobs, but also confident of living great lives, which will be with more than one employer to have friendships that will nurture them to have a relationship that will with this institution that will be important to them. So I, I even find it hard to describe our employers as customers. So it's really the entire world at large that are they really going to lead lives which will make them as happier, wholesome yeah, I mean, I, people? So you know, I, I'm, I, I want to stay very true to our mission statement. Our mission statement is to educate leaders who make a difference in the world. Wonderful. And that's the devotion. So I think of our students as leaders with a lot of potential that we are privileged to have. And how can we allow them to make the most of that potential in a way that enriches themselves and the world? That, that's the ultimate view I have of what, our, what, of what we're trying to do. Arvind Kumar, who earlier asked you, by the way, which hostel were you in IIT Mumbai? Hostel 7. Hostel Lady seven. of the Lake, which is now <laughs> on a dying lake, but nevertheless, <laughs> Lady of the Lake. <laughs> okay. So he's asking a question. While most of the global universities focus on producing excellent managers and leaders from a selective group of students, is there any plan HPS has to make his knowledge learning available even for a student sitting in the remotest part of the world who are unable to afford quality education? So, you know, uh, at some level, we've been doing that for a very long time. I know that people may not always think that, but uh, because when people think about what education looks like, their, their view is, can you come into my classroom? But my first exposure to Harvard Business School was through Harvard Business Review. I remember actually sitting in a company where the idea of a focus factory was being implemented in the company. And all of us who were in that company were given, this is in a summer job in IIT Bombay. 
were given this Harvard Business Review article to read as a way to understand what a focus factory is. It was one of the landmark articles of the time. So we make our case studies available. I, I imagine that they're used in your school as they are in many other schools. So we have always tried to make our education available to lots and lots of people. Now with Harvard Business School Online, we've created a platform where we hope that even some of the our faculty and the kind of magic of the case method can be brought online on scale. I actually think that this moment where we have learned how to project ourselves electronically a little bit more will create even more opportunities for us to reach people more broadly. So I think the outreach of the school, to me, this the single most exciting thing that's gonna happen in education in the next 20 to 25 years is that I think this access to excellent education is gonna become much more widely available in the next 20 years than it is today. So in, in some ways, like what Amazon did for goods and services to make access to goods and services that previously would have been very hard to reach a small village. Now, if you have a phone, you can get that and in some ways have that be delivered. You're seeing this with Baiju, you're seeing this with other things, even in India, that you are, you're seeing a certain type of, what I would call edutainment today being delivered in a more mass scale democratic way. But I, I think more serious education, which is still very compelling because at some level, if serious education is not compelling, it's still not something that people will want. I actually think we're gonna see the golden years in which excellent education will be spread more widely around the world. It's one of the most exciting things right now uh, that the future holds. And this pandemic will have helped that by the way, in some weird way, this pandemic would have helped. In this one way, it will be positive. It will actually make education more, dem you know, de democratize great education around the world. So Shivani Bhatnagar, our student asked a question, but she's got an answer through what you just now spoke. So let me move to the next question. So do you have any plans? The government of India has just announced that they will permit foreign universities to enter India. And for the after a long debate, it was clear day before yesterday by the cabinet. Has there been any conversation of actually potentially setting up a campus in a country like India? So again, I'm philosophically opposed to this idea. So I, I, that doesn't mean that our next dean or someone else may not consider it, but at least I can explain to you philosophically why I'm opposed to it. Uh, I think that countries need their own great educational institutions. We should invest in the next set of IIMs. We should invest in soil. We should, And to the extent that institutions like ours can play a helpful role as we did with Ayam Antabad, to just share with people what we're doing, but then to allow people to develop a, an educational system that is more responsive to the local place. It's hard enough for me to sustain excellence at our business school on our Boston campus. The thought experiment that I've often run with me is that suppose I was to create a campus in India or in any other location in the world and students could would be asked to go to one of our other campuses by a coin toss, would they be equally happy? Or would they all prefer to come to Boston if given a choice? If you cannot develop the internal confidence that every one of your campuses would be equally worthy, I think you should hesitate from creating this thing. And I. I applaud INSEAD. INSEAD is the only school that I know of that has come close to being able to actually create an experience where now students at INSEAD are indifferent about whether they are chosen to study at the Fontainebleau campus or the Singapore campus. They have an Abu Dhabi campus which hasn't yet quite reached that same level. So, but why are we so obsessed about foreign universities? I mean, we should be excited about building local universities that are great. I'm proud of having gone to IIT. I, I would never have gone to, I, if I had the privilege of going to MIT as an undergraduate versus going to IIT Bombay as an undergraduate, I feel no difference. I felt very excited about going to, I, I want that to be true of education in India rather than us saying, you know, it's only because I could go to an international institution that I got a better education. So Nitin, uh, what a joy to listen to you. As somebody said that it was wonderful to see you in flow. And I want to begin by, I learned this from you, that uh, you 
not only love your parents and your sister very much, you acknowledge as to how they have made you a better people. And, you know, I have so many things to say about uh, your mother as well, but uh, let's just say begin with that thought first. The second thing is that you explain to us that do not just keep thinking about the future. Be in the present moment. And always ask yourself the question that what is the purpose of education? That what am I trying to live this for? This is not just to get a job or to, you know, define the student as a customer. I just really love that. That how can you just think about your student as a customer? Because the relationship is so deep that it is not just about calling the person a customer. And also that way the industry, I think what you said is that we are really in the field of education because we are helping people to discover who they are and to take responsibility for that and to live a life which makes a difference to others. And the very last thing that I just want to acknowledge, the greatest joy that you have experienced in your life has been when your work has helped others to realize their potential. And what a wonderful statement, you know, I could, uh, I found that so wonderful to hear from you because some of the happiest moments in my life have been when I've seen some of my students, alumni and former colleagues excel. And, you know, I feel like dancing with joy to see them excel on world stage and you know you know that actress. feeling is the best <laughs> feeling in the world <laughs> it's the best yeah. feeling so <laughs> so thank you very much for reinforcing that and i just want uh, mr kaval noria for a moment to come in and to say what he'll move to say as at, at the end of this session i yes, have sir. to say nothing thank you i enjoyed it that was okay thank you very much sir thank you thank you what a privilege it has been for all of us thank you nitin thank you once thank again you so and much thank for you me and, and thank yes. you so much for this very special occasion in which I could do this and be introduced by my father. Thank you very much. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much.